um, the paint that we have access to. So we're going to all weirdly crowd into this room. And just try to make yourself comfortable. I apologize. It's a small space here. A couple things of this. For our particular mural, uh, we will not be using uh, any kind of tape. Everything's already drawn out and ready to go. However, if you want to do a mural, even in your own you know, uh, home or something, in your bedroom or something like that, um, certain things you should know. So, these are all different types of uh, masking tape, right? Uh, the term masking literally comes from the idea that, like wearing a Halloween mask, right? You are blocking something and you're painting over it, right? That you are masking it, you're covering over it. So, of course, we've got just plain old masking tape, right? Same stuff you get at the store there. We have painter's tape, and then we have this stuff here, which is uh, frog tape. Um, frog tape is just a name brand type of painter's tape. Um, so, just to give you kind of a different idea on what we're dealing with, right? All of these have different uh, kind of stickiness qualities to it, right? I would highly, highly suggest whether you're painting a mural or whether you're painting on a piece of canvas, highly suggest that you go with frog tape. It's my personal favorite. Um, painter's tape works just fine. Uh, I personally like frog tape better. I've had much better success as far as peeling the, t uh, the tape off of the wall and not taking the wall with it, right? Uh, even painter's tape sometimes, especially if I'm painting on a canvas and I'm trying to tape something off, you can absolutely peel your paint back off of the canvas, okay? What ends up happening is this. Whenever you're starting to paint something, say just like a plain old wall, right? Understand that that paint is trying to stick, literally like adhere, like a glue, to the actual fibers of the wall. If the wall is ultra smooth, which most walls are, right? If you're using like uh, some kind of plasterboard or something, most walls are very, very smooth. That paint has nothing to stick to, right? Imagine if I put paint onto like a pane of glass, right? A pane of glass is like extremely smooth, right? I can take a fingernail and just scratch it back off again. It has nothing to stick to, right? So if you're gonna paint something, say, in like the wood shop, if you make uh, your own kind of dresser, or if you're gonna like rehab something, you go onto Craigslist, you buy an old table, and they're gonna like repaint it, right? And you're not gonna use spray paint. Spray paint's different, it's a different type of paint. Um, but if you're not gonna use spray paint, if you're gonna use liquid paint, Highly suggest take some sandpaper, rough it up a little bit. Uh, it feels like you're damaging the wood, but really what you're doing is kind of grinding it so it has some teeth on it, a little bit of tooth. That gives the paint something to grab onto and hold, and that way you won't accidentally scrape it off. If you ever find that you have paint on a wall or on a piece of furniture that's scraping off, it's because it's too smooth. That's what's happening. Um, tape works kind of the same idea. The different stickiness of this tape is kind of like a tooth in reverse, right? How much is the tape hanging on? If I use plain old masking tape, Right? and I stick it to a piece of, uh, you know, maybe the paint is recently dried, or like this paint here is totally flaking. Um, if I stick this to here and I start peeling it off, it's gonna take the paint with it, right? Uh, this masking tape has a pretty good stickiness. Um, painter's tape naturally has less stickiness because they know that you're gonna be peeling it off. Um, personally, I like the frog tape. I think that it just works better in general uh, than even uh, painter's tape. So, different ways to use your paint, or your tape. Uh, a good suggestion too, just so you guys know this already, again, we're not using tape for this project, but just so you know. Good suggestion is this. Whenever you go to uh, tape something, right? Whenever you go to paint something with uh, tape, you want a clean line, right? Let's say, for example, that I'm going to tape right on this ceiling, right? If I want a clean line right here, the smartest thing to do is take the color of paint you already have, so the underlying coat, right? Take that paint and paint over your tape. Now, it makes no sense, right? Because I'm trying to make a clean, say, like a blue line or something, right? Why am I painting the same color I already have? You guys have probably used tape before at some point. Some of that paint gets kind of underneath your tape, makes those little weird splotchy lines, right? You know what I mean? So if I paint it white first, let that dry, then paint my actual color, any tape, or excuse me, any paint that is gushed or underneath that tape is white. So whenever I peel it off, right, that tape, if it did gush underneath, I won't even see it because it's the same color as the ceiling. Does that kind of make sense? So even though it feels like an extra dab of work, Whenever you're doing any kind of tape work, uh, apply your, your undercoat, apply your tape, do one more coat of that undercoat than the thing that you actually want to paint and peel that tape. It's going to give you a crisp, clean line every time. It's going to work out beautifully. Cool? Tape. Cool. So this is all of our blah, blah, paint. So all of this stuff is uh, paint that I have purchased uh, throughout the years. Um, you'll notice that almost all of it is random leftover paint. Um, I paint a lot of murals for myself. This is all my like personal collection of paint. Um, highly suggest if you guys have any interest in uh, doing murals or any kind of paint work yourself, um, when you go to Lowe's, when you go to Home Depot, uh, they have a little shelf that's called the Whoops Paint. Um, look at the Whoops Paint. Uh, this thing cost me 50 cents. This is enough to paint like that entire wall. Cost me 50 cents. 
right? Whoops Paint is my best friend in the world. Um, what's great is you just kind of randomly, like throughout the year, I'll just randomly collect different uh, colors and values, and that way I don't need to go to the store and actually buy it. I already have a huge collection. This entire collection I have purchased, it probably cost me somewhere in the vein of like $40 for all of this, right? Whoops Paint is your new best friend, I promise. Um, so there's that. Even like big jugs like this, right? Even big jugs and stuff. Um, normally a, a whole gallon of paint will cost somewhere in the vein of like 30 to 40 bucks. Uh, this one cost me seven dollars, right? Like, Whoops Paint is your best friend. Just saying. Um, so there's that. Other things that you should know, interior versus exterior. So you can get these little sample sizes. The samples are always interior paint. They'll tell you that they're both. They're not. They're interior paint. Um, but you can also buy uh, exterior paint as well as interior paint. The obvious uh, difference is the fact that one is meant for inside, one's meant for outside. If it's exterior paint, it's going to be much, much thicker, much more viscous. Uh, it's a little bit harder to apply because it, it's goopier, right? Like a big thick glue, right? But the idea is I'm painting on the outside of the building. So if I'm painting a big brick wall that's going to get rain and sunshine and all these kind of things, absolutely use exterior paint. Pay the extra $10 and get the paint that will last because you use interior paint on a brick wall, that mural is coming down in like six months. Uh, it is going to peel and flake and kind of get crusty and it's not going to look pretty. Uh, the paint is not meant to last uh, against the sun and the rain. A lot of times whenever you paint an exterior mural, people will expect that, um, that your worst enemy is going to be weathering. Honestly, water isn't that big of a deal. All this paint is uh, acrylic paint, which means it's latex based. Um, it is all rubberized basically. Same paint you use inside your house. When you touch your wall, it doesn't feel crusty. It feels like kind of smooth rubber, right? Um, this paint literally has liquid rubber uh, latex inside of it. So when it dries, it gets kind of nice and smooth. Um, that's why if you ever see like old paint, you can actually like peel it off and it looks like, like skin, kind of like gross, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that's because the rubber is basically sticking to itself. Um, so, really, water is not your enemy here. Sunlight is. If you're painting, painting an exterior mural, uh, sunlight is the thing that will slowly diminish your mural. Um, think about like a tattoo, right? If I had a tattoo, which I don't because I'm terrified of needles, but if I had a tattoo, um, you guys probably know if you have one yourself, after about a year or two, you have to go back to the tattoo artist to get those colors kind of pumped back in again to kind of revitalize that, that um, uh, ink in the mural, or excuse me, in your tattoo. That's because your body is absorbing that ink slowly and breaking it down. The sun is kind of doing the same thing in reverse. The sun is kind of baking that mural, and as it does, it's literally pulling out some bits of the, uh, the color, the vibrancy. Uh, and so you definitely want to make sure of um, uh, using an exterior paint that can uh, sustain that. Um, they do make uh, clear coats that will cover over your exterior mural and help it. Personally, I don't like using those because they tend to yellow uh, over time. So like a, th a thin kind of clear coat varnish uh, will eventually yellow. Uh, I would rather just have to go back and repaint it in five years. I think it looks better that way. That's my personal opinion. So when we do our murals, you guys have access to all of this. The best suggestion is this. Instead of just showing up like a kid in a candy store and I say, I want this one, I want this one, I want two of these, I want one of those, like, instead of just grabbing and going, right, look at the design that I've already laid out for you, and I, we'll talk about that in a second, but look at the design. Most of it is kind of a paint by number style, so you should only need four or five colors, but let's say you're on a team of four people painting this single mural. The best advice I have is grab, say, let's say, uh, for the skin color, we're going to say this is our highlight color, right? Just call this, like, number one, right? Have a single paintbrush. Uh, and we're going to call that the number one paintbrush. That way you're not cross-contaminated. I'm going to take in this paintbrush and I'm swirling it over here. This paintbrush goes with this jar, jar of paint. So you paint a little bit, you set it down. Oh, you need number one. You pick it up, right? That way they're, they're connected, right? Paintbrush and paint it makes things way, way smoother. And that way you just know, almost like a paint by numbers, right? Literally, oh, I need that highlight color. What is that? Uh, look at your chart. Yep, that's number one. I need jar number one. Right? So you're way smarter to pick your colors out ahead of time and just set them there and have them ready to go. Cool? Okie dokie. So um, that's pretty much our, our paint. When you're painting a mural, one last thing that I'll tell you is this. Um, less is more. Uh, anytime I do a mural, a lot of times I'll see people buy gallons and gallons of paint. If I was to paint this whole wall that you see right here, right, this whole wall right here, this is way too much paint. Like a ridiculous amount of paint. I don't need that much. Literally, this little sample size will paint that whole wall, right? Now, if I wanted to paint this whole room, I might need four or five of these, right? At a certain point, maybe I buy, instead of four or five of those, I get one of these guys instead, right? One of these guys would take care of two of these walls, right? At a certain point, I say, I need more than this. 
that's when I upgrade to the gallon, right? But don't immediately jump into the gallon. There's lots of other sizes of paint. You can save yourself a whole bunch of money. Um, gallons are very, very expensive. Um, don't, don't buy them unless you need them. All right, you guys can pile onto the back here real quick. Okay. So, I've had these paintbrushes sitting out for the entire semester. You're still welcome to all of them. Um, if you would like a different paintbrush, if you find that whenever you're painting the mural that the paintbrushes I'm giving you here are used and crusty, that's cool. Go, go get another one or tell me and I'll, I'll go run out and grab you another one. Um, but there's different types of paintbrushes that you should be aware of. Okay. So first off, um, we've got just the big old guys, right? So let's see. Here's two different types. Okay. So two different types of paintbrushes, but look at how this guy here is pretty thick and bushy, pretty smooth, right? This guy's kind of wiry. He's not as, as bushy. He's not as uh, thick, right? So you can pass this around real quick. Um, the thinner of the two uh, is called a chip brush. Uh, I actually like painting murals with chip brushes. They cost like a dollar. They are dirt cheap. When they get clogged up, you throw them away, right? They're just, they're just trash brushes. Um, but if you need to make like a crisp, clean line, if you're trying to like edge your painting or something, uh, don't use a chip brush. It's going to look like trash, right? If you're just covering a wall, just grab a chip brush, use it up, and throw it away when you're done. It's the easiest way to go, okay? If you buy something that's like a nicer quality brush, make sure to clean it out because otherwise it gets crusty and gross. Um, you can see even with this one here, whatever color we were using, kind of an orange color, um, you don't want to go much higher than that with your paint. Right, whenever you're dunking it in the uh, gallon of paint or in the, in the half gallon or something. Um, if you get paint up in here, this metal part is called the furl. Um, if paint gets up in there, it can actually expand and push the bristles out of your paintbrush. Right? If it expands too much, eventually it will actually pop the um, metal, the uh, furl, right off the handle of the actual brush. Right? Um, this can also just be pour glue, or glue in there too. But for the most part, um, if you get paint up in that metal bit, it is no good, right? So whenever you're painting, whether it's a tiny brush or a really big brush, make sure not to like kablunk, dunk it all in there and then kind of kind of splatter it on, right? Little bits at a time, wipe off the edge and then apply a little bit, dip a little more, right? Less is more. When you're painting something, whether it be a wall or whether it's a mural or anything like that, you are much, much better off to paint um, many light coats. Right? If I'm painting this room, instead of taking globs of paint and kind of smacking them on there, it's going to take 14 years to dry. It's going to look runny and beady and just gross. Right? Instead, a little bit of paint, bup, 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 let it dry. A little bit more paint, bup, 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 let it dry. Build up little tiny coats. It's going to look clean and crisp and it's going to last many, many years. And it's not going to flake and peel off that wall. Right? Many thin coats. When you go to um, actually dip out and grab some paint, I'm just going to use water here real quick. Okay. When you go to kind of dip in your paintbrush, right, don't glob, kind of glob it in there and kind of like, uh, if it's all drippy, right, then that's no good, right? You don't want drips with your paint, right? Instead, kind of get it in there, right? What I like to do is kind of just scoop on one side. So it basically becomes like a spoon, right? In essence, it's kind of holding one side of the paint. Right? I don't need paint as much on both sides because that's when it gets drippy. I don't need to wipe both sides because then I don't have any paint in my paintbrush. Right? So dip, wipe. Now I've got a good amount of paint, but it's not drippy. Right? One little wipe on one side, plenty of paint on the other side. Cool? Okay. <clears throat> um, like I said, lots and lots of different brushes. You'll notice that they look different. Some have different handles, right? Some have a longer handle, some have a much shorter handle. This is an edging brush right here. This is also a totally ruined brush. Um, this is an edging brush. You would hold it kind of in the crook of your thumb like this, kind of wrap your fingers around. And you can get really clean, quick little edges. But if for some reason you don't clean out your brush, if you, or for that matter, if you think you clean it out, and cleaning to you is good enough, um, if you are not rinsing out your paintbrush, bad things can happen. And this is a prime example. Yeah, that's, that's not coming back anytime soon. Um, remember that we're dealing with latex paint. It is liquid rubber. When rubber dries, I can't like add water to it and make it liquidize again, right? My tires don't turn to puddles whenever it rains outside, right? If it turns solid, it's solid. You've just killed a paintbrush, right? So whenever you're cleaning a paintbrush, any paintbrush, right? Let's see if I can get like a crusty looking one. Yeah, this guy's kind of crusty. Okay, whenever you're cleaning a paintbrush, here's how you do it. It's super easy. You guys already know most of this stuff, right? But I still want to make sure you guys know. So, come on in and get a little closer if you want. When you're coming in to clean, right? 
get the water going, take your hand, or your non-dominant hand, whatever you have, take your paintbrush. Kind of get it under there just so it starts to kind of run, right? Once you've done that, you need to agitate it in some way. Now, you can just kind of brush it on the bottom of the sink. That's absolutely fine. I personally like to do it with my hand because I'm tall and this hurts my back. But I literally will just put my hand underneath the sink, right? And just make little swirls with my paintbrush. Little swirls inside the sink, right? So I'm in here, little tiny swirls. That's all you need to do. I'm not grinding my fingers into it. I'm not like attacking the paintbrush, right? Little tiny swirls, that's it, right? You will see the paint just run right out of your paintbrush, just like so. When you're done, you can hammer it out or you can kind of squeegee it very lightly with your fingers. You don't need to pull on it. Remember that these bristles are only nailed in place. They're just sitting there loosely, right? If I tug on this, I will pull the bristles out, right? So just a light, gentle squeeze or a little slap will do you. Um, a little bit wet is okay. Paint in there is not okay, right? I remember that again, we're dealing with much thicker paint than before. You will absolutely clog up the bristles and they will be unworkable uh, like that paintbrush, right? Um, so please, when you're done for the day, clean up your paintbrushes. Even if you only used one, even if you used 15, clean them. Cool?